your question in this particular teaching on women. I hope you're getting something out of this because there's a lot of wisdom in it. And really, this is not something you're going to be able to listen to once and get it. You should go back and listen to it again sometime. I'm just saying. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that when we get into the Word of God and we start seeing something that is different than what we were taught, it's really important for us to go to the Word of God ourselves. And I mean, really what I'm trying to do is just get you to look at it, look at the Scriptures, go back, write the Scriptures down and, and meditate on them. You'll see, you'll see the truth in it. Let's start out here in 1 Corinthians chapter... I'm hoping I got this right. If not, we'll move on from there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I didn't write that very clear. And I think we'll be looking down here at verse. Let me read it and see if it makes any sense. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about that. Let's go to Acts chapter two. Let's start there. It'll be better. Acts chapter two. And again, here's the bottom line: Is it scriptural for a woman or a wife to be involved in ministry, any form of ministry, helps ministry, teaching ministry? preaching ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And people ask me the question all the time. Well, Pastor Tom, don't you think it's better that a man be a pastor? Only because, only because we're still struggling. You know, some, it, with this subject, it's, it's like, you know, in the old South, some people still struggle, believe it or not, with racism. And we should be over that. Now, it's not nearly like it used to be. And uh, as far as racism goes, but we still have a lot of prejudice and we still have a lot of prejudice against women. But quite frankly, women can do anything spiritually a man can do. Is it better for a man to pastor a church? Easier, easier. But if you go overseas, like to Panama, as an example, because I've been there many times, some of the best pastors were women. I'm not kidding either. The people loved them. The men there loved them. They had large churches. They prospered. The, the congregations were, were prospering. Some of them were the better teachers than the men were. And I'm just telling you that because it's true. And it's that way all over the world. Wherever women can be used, wherever they'll let them. So that's what I say about it. Um, certainly, if a woman was single, she would be, um, you know, it would be wisdom for her to have a real good, uh, maybe a board around her uh, with guys on and stuff, too because you get a different perspective. But <clears throat> if they're, they have a character and they're qualified, what would be the difference? Really not a whole lot. Um, Acts chapter 2. And let's look down here again. We read it already one time, but I want to make sure that we read it again. Because it's true and it needs to be said. Verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your young uh, uh, old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days my spirit, and uh, they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. So, prophecy. That's loud. Many times can be in church. So a woman can prophesy. A woman can speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A woman can uh, preach, teach. A woman can lead people to the Lord. A woman can, praise God, be an evangelist. Some of them are the greatest evangelists I know are women. Always have been. All right? Look at Acts chapter 11. Let's go through the scriptures here a little bit. Especially in the book of Acts here for a minute. Acts chapter 11. Verse 
Now remember, the women were there on the day of Pentecost. They were there praying, just like the men. They got the same thing the men did. They spoke out loud. They prophesied. They prayed in the Spirit like the men did. Uh, okay. Now here in Acts chapter 11, uh, let's look at here. Make sure I got this right. Let's see. No, that's not what I wanted. Anyway, I think I was, I was just, I was, I put that scripture down twice. The point I'm trying to make here is, is that these women got filled with the Holy Ghost just like the men did. That was the, the church at Jerusalem. So they were breaking the rule already by having the, the, uh, Jesus brought the, the men and the women together. Let me uh, talk about that just for a second. When you see Jesus in the Gospels, many times he had women following him that would minister to his needs physically and so on and so forth. And I don't mean that in some kind of a bizarre way. I'm talking about feeding them, taking care of some of the stuff, and even giving offerings. Also, though, they had guys. And, and there was 70 of them sent out that Jesus sent out into the mission field, so to speak. And I guarantee you, some of those were probably husband and wife teams. That would have been easy to do, and um, they're already breaking the rules with that uh, to a certain extent in society. And so um, already it started. Really, Jesus was a maverick when it came to that. You know, he, he talked to the woman at the well. He just didn't do that in those days. You, it was, the Jews wouldn't do that, but he did it, you know, and um, he, he, he was something else. But then, you know, in when the church started, it was in Jerusalem, and everybody heard these people speak in other tongues, some of them were women. And so that broke the rule, because they're not supposed to be out there in the middle of the streets doing anything like that. Then when you look at Acts chapter 10, and we see, well, actually, if you, if you look at Acts chapter 8 first, you see here that... Uh, Philip goes down to, to uh, uh, Samaria, <coughs> which was half Jews that had mixed with the heathens. And Philip went down and preached Christ to them. And the people who, uh, with one accord, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and they were taken with the palsies and they were lame, were healed and there was great joy in the city. And so we see here that these people were converted. Well, some of them were women. And praise God, verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were, were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And they be, laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. So immediately you would see if, if women were, were not to take place with anything within a church service or anything like that, why would God baptize them in the Holy Ghost the same way he did the guys, have them speak with tongues, sometimes even prophesy like the guys? Doesn't make any sense, of course. Well, that was the early church was starting. The same thing happened over in Acts chapter 10. Peter got up. He's preaching to the Gentiles. The Holy Ghost falls on them. No altar call. And everybody in that place that, that believed started speaking with tongues, both men and women. We know it was a mixed crowd. Interesting. Very interesting. But we see uh, all through the Bible, actually, if you look at the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, you see people like Deborah, you see people like, you know, uh, Esther and all these having a major role, even in Jewish times. God could still use some of them. God got them into those positions. Very interesting. If you study it, I mean, women have always had a role. And they, a lot of times, broke the rules to do it. So God was making a statement. It's okay. He's for women, not against them. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 1, 
verse 39, we see this here. And Mary arose in those days and went in the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb and uh, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice. Elizabeth spoke out with a loud voice when she prophesied. And she prophesied. Amen. You see, breaking all the rules. Then in uh, verse 46, you got this. And Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. And he, uh, she went on to prophesy too. Oh, they're breaking the rules. Can't do that as a woman. And then Luke chapter 2. Verse 36. Luke chapter 2, I believe it is, uh, verse 36. I could tell I was getting tired when I got to this point because I'm writing all kinds of weird stuff down, but I think it is Luke chapter 2. Hmm. Oh, boy. I think it's... Uh, yeah, let me see. Verse 36, that's what I wanted. Okay, I got it. And there was one Anna, a prophetess. Well, there's prophetesses in the Old Testament too. They had to speak out. The daughter of Phineel, the tribe of Asher. She was great age and had lived with a hus husband 70 years with, from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she's coming in the uh, instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all of them looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city in Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and filled with wisdom and grace and great grace was upon them. So this woman here, she... She recognized Jesus and prophesied. In Acts chapter 18, verse 26, we see another one. We see women were always involved. We just go over these scriptures, and sometimes we don't pay attention to them. But we should pay attention to them because all of the scripture is important. And uh, we need to realize that. It's there for a reason. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him into them and expounded unto him the way of, the, of God more perfectly. <laughs> All right. So here we got a little pastoral couple or apostolic couple. It's really interesting. Uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, who both spoke the word of God. In fact, um, some Bible scholars believe that that church that was started in their house, Paul was part of that, and that Priscilla was really the pastor there, and Paul uh, submitted to that. Hallelujah. In Psalms 68, verse 11, the, the word here, company, that you'll read in the King James Version, actually means a company of female, uh, uh, a company of female preachers. Hallelujah. And in Psalm 68, 11, the same thing, same word. Uh, the Lord gave happy tidings, uh, they, they, them that published, the female messengers, or a, a numerous host of female messengers. Actually, the word could be translated in, into the New Testament as apostles. How would you feel if a woman with a call was sitting in church, knew they were called, but because of one of these doctrines, couldn't obey God. Wouldn't that be a horrible thing? I think it would be. I've talked about it again, but I'll bring it up again because it's important. We need to understand that. Now, about head coverings. 
this is also something that it's just a cultural thing. In Eastern culture, Paul said a woman who prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered uh, dishonored her head. What's that all about? He didn't say she dishonored God, but her head or a wife's husband. And that was the point. Again, it's a husband and wife thing. In other words, she wouldn't just go out and start prophesying out of order and things like that. It, in that culture, it would have been better. Her husband was the, uh, the, the covering. The, the covering represented that she was covered by her husband. You know, people get the weirdest ideas about this. It's a custom. Paul said it, it's just a custom. And if you don't have that custom, fine. If you do, fine too. So, but it is dangerous for a wife to get out of place in the family unit. I've said this before. Because the Bible says that the angels get provoked when this happens. And it can become a great issue. In other words, the angelic hosts that are sent to minister to us and take care of us and protect us, when a wife takes the role of a husband or, and so on and overrides her husband and all that, they have to back off. Now, I wonder how many times tragedy has happened because of that very thing. Probably quite a few. It's very interesting. But uh, this is... Uh, Verse 16 of that uh, chapter. In fact, I didn't give you the chapter, I don't think. We were talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 3 through 16, where it talks about head coverings and all that. I want to go over there. I'm just going to tell you that's all culture. Uh, in verse 16, he says, we have no such custom in the West. We don't care about that. But in some places, if you go, you, you got to wear a hat. Or uh, uh, Men wear hats. Women have things over their heads. That's their custom. And that's fine. They want to do that. We don't have that custom here, and that's fine too. So the natural thing would be for a woman with long hair to have it long because it's, it's just kind of a natural thing. Uh, men will have shorter hair. But again, it's really, it doesn't mean anything. It's a custom. I know in some societies men have long hair. We have people with long hair. I used to have long hair. And it's not really, there's nothing in here to argue about. It's just a custom. The main message is a married woman needs to respect the biblical role and the married man uh, or husband needs to respect, uh, the uh, married woman or married man needs to respect the biblical role. And I've seen dominating women take men out of good churches, and I've, I've, I'm going to say it again, and all kinds of things. In fact, this is a real problem. So when you see that, when you become a Christian and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, men, you need to take the role of your, your role seriously as the head of the home. And you cannot allow the woman to have that role because you're not protecting her if you do that. You need to sit down her and show her the scriptures. And if she cannot, she just cannot accept it, she probably needs deliverance. I'm telling you right now. Now, I'm going to end this. Okay, on a note that probably get me in some trouble, but here we go. What is proper dress and adornment for a Christian woman? Let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to read it again. How should Christian women dress? And the reason I, I'm addressing this is because it's necessary. We have a real problem in the church world. I have literally seen women in church, even pastors, even pastors' wives, that really did not dress properly. I remember one time we were on the road. We were in a certain place. And, uh, well, let me read this scripture first, and then we'll get to that. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. Uh, it says, uh, in, like, in, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Write that down. With shame, face in the sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. But because, which, which becomes women professing God in us with good works. All right, now, first thing I want you to know about this is that, again, Paul is addressing something here that's custom. One of the things that, that he was addressing here is that 
women in society, the normal average woman out here never would wear something like that. Only prostitutes would wear that type of thing. And so Paul <coughs> is basically saying to Timothy, um, look, don't let the, you know, explain to the women that they should not, they should not draw attention to themselves like a prostitute would in the way they dress. We need that message today. I was, uh, we were out on the road as an example, and uh, we were in a certain part of the na uh, nation. I used to go back there every year, love the church, love the pastors. But the wife would lead the worship. And how can I say this without, I guess I'll just have to say it. She wore tight top and uh, kind of a t-shirt top. And I, I'm not saying she didn't have a bra on, but if she did, you couldn't have told because it left nothing to, and she's leading worship, folks. It left nothing to the imagination. I mean, I don't mean to be vulgar, but I mean, it, she, just stuck, she just stuck right out. And for whatever reason, the pastor didn't see it. Whatever reason, she didn't see it. And they're good people. They're godly people. But why can't, you know, we should be very careful about that kind of stuff. I've seen pastors, wives, quite frankly, that dressed very low cut, had their boobs hanging out. If I get, if I get to, if I see one more uh, rock star or pop star get up and praise God, and while they're praising God, half of their cleavage is showing, and their their dress is hiked all the way up to New Orleans, I'm going to throw something at the TV. That kind of stuff needs to be addressed by their pastors. But yet, I have seen churches, especially in these large mega churches, where the whole front row, I've seen it on TV, where the whole front row was almost all women. And every single one of those women were dressed provocatively. I think they're probably after that pastor. And this is pervasive in some churches. Now we see people leading worship like this. We have gay people leading worship. But, but the dress for a woman and for a man is important. He says moderate, moderately dress. Does a woman that is a Christian need to look like a Quaker? Does she need to put on, look like she has a gunny sack covering her up, combat boots on, not have any kind of makeup on? The answer to that is absolutely not. I believe Christian women can dress very beautifully and then can set an example, I've seen them over the years, we have some really good ones in our church, without being skanky, if I can use that term, without showing off too much. Now, you women out there that are listening to me, don't turn your head, turn me off here. You may not even know it. Some, I, I'm, I'm amazed that people wouldn't know it. But sometimes people do things subconsciously, they don't even realize they're doing it especially a single girl is trying to get a guy to, to uh, you know, or, or be attractive to guys, you know, looking for a husband, let's say. And she begins to choose her wardrobe uh, to make herself look what we would call attractive, sexy. She thinks that that's the way she's going to win that guy. Well, that's not true. What you're going to do is attract the wrong type of guy probably. And being a Christian... We need to be careful because men are turned on by sight. Write it down. Men are turned on by sight. That's why they do that, a lot of them. And so what you're doing in a church when you come to church and you're dressed like that, you are providing a opportunity for men to start be looking at the wrong thing. I remember one time I, uh, that's how men are, you know. I mean, uh, it, it's just the way we we're, we're God made us that way. We kind of, uh, just it's just the way we're made up. And it's nothing funny about it. It's just the way it is. I remember Stella and I were in, I've seen this many times, but we were in Panama, Central America. Now, you must understand, Central America, any of those nations down there, but you go to Brazil or Panama, you know, those, those types of places. Number one, the males, the, the, the guys are handsome. A lot, a lot of them have movie star looks. 
their brown skin, the way the the, the way they're you know they come from wherever they come from, the the mixture of skin and everything. It's really beautiful, and they're very handsome guys. And so on the other side of the of the table is the women folk, and they they don't they do not have a tendency. Excuse me, <coughs> in these countries, to be overweight. <coughs> like people are in America. Excuse me. I get a little water. We've got stuff in the air. Terrible here. So they're not overweight. They're normally very thin, have nice shapes, if you know what I mean. And uh, so they're very beautiful. A lot of them have movie star looks. I mean, seriously, you walk down the road and you're amazed at how many of these people are just really beautiful people. Well, in the churches down there, some of them have this custom that they developed over the years about <clears throat> having women come and dance. In other words, you know, they do the flags, they do the the the, uh, the, the dancing before the Lord. They come they come out from the sides, and they do that. And I've noticed that they just don't have a whole lot of heavy set women doing it, but a lot of young, attractive women will do this. And they don't dress skinkily. It's not like they're not covered up. They're covered up very well, but they're, they're women. You can see the shape. And so I noticed something I saw sitting there, and the glory of the Lord starts rolling in the building. And I'm very sensitive to that because I'm going to have this meeting here, and I'm sitting in the front row, and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to have a great meeting. The glory of the Lord's here. And then they, all of a sudden this music comes on, and here they come. And when they came out, I noticed as I was looking around, the guys all had their hands up, you know, and they're worshiping, and they get their eyes closed, and they're caught up worshiping the Lord. And here come these girls, and all of a sudden they start doing this dancing, and and it wasn't anything really ungodly about the dance. It wasn't that the, the it was sensuous or anything like that. It was just the fact that they were women, just the fact that they were pretty women, just the fact that they had on a tight enough garments to where you could tell they were women, and as they did this, the guys went from this to this. And they're watching the, the women dance. All right? And when that, when that happened, I noticed the atmosphere immediately changed and the glory just backed right out of the room because God was grieved because of that. That's what I'm talking about, women. You don't realize you can influence even a whole service sometimes. If you don't, know, if you know better, and you do it anyway, so we need to be careful about that. We don't want to be a stumbling block. In First Peter chapter three, we don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't think any of you ladies want to be a stumbling block. In First Peter chapter three, verses one through, where it says, "Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands." that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word be won by the con um, conversation, which means lifestyle, of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or lifestyle, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be, but the outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair and the wearing of gold, putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of a great price. Now, I want you to know, I think personally, that's more important when considering marrying somebody than beauty. Now, my wife is a beauty queen. She's, when, when I married her, I saw her, well, she, she always looked so young. She still looks young today, but back then, she was very tan. I'm going to be honest about it. Uh, she was a very young Christian, so some of her dress was not the best. And I had to wean her off of that stuff. But I'll tell you what, she would walk into a room and light up the room. She was just like movie star looks. If she dressed in a white dress, as an example, it was just like because she was dark skinned. It was just, you, you just, you had to look at her. It was, she was amazing. Well, that is uh, what he's saying here, uh, you know, many times women will dress so men will look at them, but that does not necessarily mean you want to marry a woman. But the other side of my wife was when I started 
talking to her and we had a, a conversations, she was quiet, she was um, respectful, she, she very much wanted the, the, everything I wanted in life, pretty much, when we talked about children, when we talked about family, when we talked about me, you know, she didn't, she, she wanted to be a mother, she wanted to be a housewife, she wasn't, she wasn't looking to be the lawyer or whatever it was, and that, it's okay too, but I'm just saying, she was, that, that was what was more attractive to me, was that aspect of her, because you see, we all know that in 10, 15, 20 years down the road, we're going to look different than we did when we were back the, in those age groups. And it happens pretty quickly, especially after children come into it and all. So that's not the main thing. Men look for somebody that can be their best friend. Men look at somebody that will, will help them and, and encourage them and be there for them, so on and so forth. Amen. So just remember this. We've covered a lot of ground, but remember this. In the Lord... There is neither male nor female. Always remember that. Don't try to put verses of Scripture, <coughs> take them out of context, and make them <coughs> say something that God never, never, never meant. Make sure that what you're saying is what he meant you to say. In Jesus' name. Well, I'm done with this series of teaching. I hope you enjoyed it. Share it with your friends if you like it. And if not, that's fine too, but I hope you liked it. And when you share it with your friends, do it to two or three or four or five or six of them. Uh, some people really need to hear this. And please, if uh, you choose to pray about it, I wish you would pray about becoming a partner with us. We need 1,000 partners to stand with us on a monthly basis. That's what we're believing for. And uh, as we grow, we're able to do more crusades. We're able to do more stuff like this. I want to do a lot more teaching and interviews and all of that kind of stuff. So you can help me get there. We appreciate you guys. There's links to all of our stuff down below. You can uh, investigate it. Until next time, this is Pastor Tom. Remember this, feed your faith, starve your dust.